Zero, zero, La Molina. Molina 414 is crossing the headwaters of the Papuri River. the rainforest of the northwest Amazon. For two years, anthropologist Peter Silverwood Cope has shared his life with the Maku, a tribe of forest hunters. You've all heard of this Amazonian forest as being a green hell full of snakes, insects, a bad place to live, hot, rainy, unfriendly Indians, a wilderness. But for these Indians, it's like a warehouse. They find their food in it, they find their medicines in it, and in it they find their meaning. No man can save anyone. It is the Lord who saves and offers salvation as a free gift to all those who will trust in him. Eleven years ago, I became a Christian. And uh, one of the first things that the Lord impressed upon me was that he wanted me to serve him. And uh, while I wasn't a preacher, and I wasn't a medical doctor, and so I knew that uh, the pulpit or the medical field was hopeless. So uh, in the course of a few months after uh, coming to know the Lord, I met a man who told me that uh, missionaries also needed transportation. They lived in remote areas and that the aircraft was one tool that made them more efficient. I'm flying all over the jungle. I go to various tribal uh, stations. So even though I may not be preaching to anyone, but I'm taking, shall we say, the preacher to the people. They know missionaries, they know policemen, they've heard of SIL evangelists. They've observed pretty carefully the behavior of the white people. Very often when a white man comes to live in this environment, he wants to carry on living like a white man. He must have his water this way or that way. He must have torches and batteries and medicines and books and lavatory paper. The Indians who approach the forest are very different. They own very little, move around easily, and they don't need to carry anything around with them. Any part of the forest they go, they can find all the materials they need. Every meal, there's always fish or meat, ants. We make drinks with the fruits. It's a good diet, I like it. I've lived on it for over a year and a half. We tend to think hunting is just being a good shot and being able to hit a target. It's not like that. It doesn't matter how good a shot you are. It doesn't mean anything unless you can find what to shoot at. And to find what to shoot at, you have to learn how to track how to call, how to see, how to hear. When you know that, then you can hunt. Quite often, smell is an indicator. Animals, pigs, boar, often rub themselves against the root of trees. 
they got lice and other parasites, so they rub themselves. And on the same day, the, the smell is still there. The time for hunting is within the rivers are dry. Sound is not blotted out, and smell is not washed out. In another season, you catch a wild boar, and I don't catch anything. I can stay in my hammock all day. You still share it with, with me and anybody else who's coming around. It's not the gift that has any meaning, but the act, the relationship of, of sharing, giving and receiving. The other day when we were putting the poison cure on the arrow points, Umero was saying, look how the poison glints. That's what you see in the eyes of the animal as it dies. Usually it's quite fast acting. When it's well made, shoot a bird in one tree, pop, 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 and it reaches another tree and there it dies, it falls. When poison is old, it doesn't hurt. You shoot an animal, it just flies away, laughing. Gomera's elder brother was shooting Churuko, the howler monkey, in a high tree. And he shot one dart and hit a monkey in the arm. The monkey pulled out the dart and threw it down and pierced him in the shoulder. People are very weak as far as poison is concerned. And so he fell on the ground, feeling very ill. He broke off his G-string and rubbed it in the, the resin of this tree, the tree from which the carrying bark comes. And he chewed this. And he drank, he made a leaf cone, and he urinated in it and drank his urine. For several hours, he lay on the ground, and he couldn't even think. If you hunt monkeys or birds with a gun, and you shoot at one, and then they all know you're there, You've killed one, all the rest run away. If you're using a blowpipe, you creep right in underneath them and you shoot as many darts as you have before they realize what's happening. In your sleep, you see animals. You run into people closely related to the hunting. Last night, Umero dreamt that he saw the ancients, the children of the sun, Today they exist just as horns, horns which women can't see. He heard three last night, which went Newly married couple Ron and Lois Metzger are North American Protestants. They're members of the Summer Institute of Linguistics, which has tribal outposts throughout Colombia. To the government, the Institute's purpose is to study the Indian languages. To the Metzgers, it's to bring the word of Christ to their tribe. It was reading the Gospels that uh, all of a sudden, uh, just overwhelmingly, I, I felt a, uh, a desire, a need to, to be saved. From, from my sin. I was reading the, uh, the crucifixion of Christ, I remember. And uh, all of a sudden it dawned on me that Christ died personally for me. Well, I came to know the Lord through that. And gradually I, I grew in the Lord. I, I thirsted after the scriptures inside. I just felt that, man, this is the thing that you, are, you should be doing. <laughs> 
Waka Munyone Waka Munyoka Utsa Tagi Utsa Munyone Waka Double Bay Musiati Munyoka Double Bay People have a terrible fear of the spirit world. We want to translate the New Testament for them, and this will help them to come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus, that they understand through reading the scriptures that Christ has power over the spirit world. They need not live every day under this, this fear. Hey ho. Hey ho. Peggy. Hey ho. Don't buy hey ho. Na hey ho, I'm a pose ricale. Po, sa, pose, se, ri, ka. I think as far as these Indians are concerned, they, they want change very much. We're here to instigate changes in their life. Just as new life comes into an oak tree, and every spring and the old leaves are there, it's as this new life comes in that the old leaves will fall off. Once they come to know the Lord, some of the things will drop off, but it's not that I'm here to say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, that's wrong, this is wrong. We're here to present them with the word and let the spirit doing the work in, this, in their life. The Indians look at missionaries they see guys who, who manipulate, control the economic source of white trade goods. They see them as being very rich people. They see them as people who give orders and people who forbid. Civilization is coming in, and it's going to come in more and more. And it's our desire to bring up their standard of living, to adjust to the onrush of civilization. The radio and the aeroplane are Ron and Lois Metzger's lifeline with the outside world. Within hours, they or their supplies can be flown in or out of the jungle. For modern missionaries like the Metzgers, operate at a level of super efficiency, backed by funds from their supporters in the United States. I think as Christians, we, uh, we are ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. These people are in another world. They might as well be on the moon. Uh, they are in another world culturally, they're in another world, in another world linguistically. And I think our, our goals, our goals as, in this group are to bridge that gap. It's, it's a linguistic barrier, uh, just as there's a spatial barrier between here and the moon. And I think it's our, our, our desire to go to the moon, to enter into their world. When one tracks, you look for things which are out of place, which are disturbed, leaves overturned, ground marked by feet of animals. The things that contrast are wet and dry. That is the indicator of time. How long ago the animal passed. The size and shape of the mark show the size of the animal, the type of animal, and the direction it was going in. Underneath the swamps, there's a whole network of underground channels. And in these channels, the eels make their nests and leave their eggs. They know exactly where to find each thing they need the minute they want it. And with a few very quick gestures, they, they turn a natural object into an artifact. And it fits into a process. And within a matter of a few seconds, they've 
They've made the running noose. They've found the, the leaf cone for the indicator. They've found a palm leaf stalk. The whole trap can be set up just from the materials which are immediately around. The man who knows what he's about will get five, six, eight yields in a day. Very often you get a day in which every single man has got eels. And there you see very well how their sharing system works, because even if you've caught an eel and I've caught an eel, I'll still cut mine up and give you half, and you'll cut yours up and give me half. They share everything very minutely. It's certainly very different to most European society. <laughs> we thank you now for this food and ask, Lord, that you bless it to the nourishment of our bodies in Christ's name. One day, the Lord Jesus is going to be coming back, and he'll judge not on the basis of how many good deeds did they do. The first judgment will be upon what did you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. If they don't believe, well, They'll be cast into the lake of fire. They'll suffer eternally. They'll go to hell. The wrath of God will abide. Maku love their children. They enjoy very close physical contact with their children. Children are are always coming up to their parents or their uncles and aunts and touching them, caressing them. I often have difficulties writing my notes because there's a couple of children in my hammock playing with my beard or looking in my ears or something like this. <laughs> The only things of the white man's world which have managed to come through to these people are the material goods, the, the clothes, the machetes, the iron pots they use. <laughs> The scriptures tell us to thirst after the spiritual milk that ye might grow thereby. And without, without that spiritual milk, without the word in their own language, milk is just like a, a baby without milk. It can't grow without milk. And I think um, this is one of the things that we want to do, is we want to be able to provide them with that uh, source of spiritual milk. The scriptures. You should talk about mailing letters. To this day, these people continue living in the forest apart from the other tribes. They remain a closed group. They exchange forest goods with the river people. About the only two European concepts which have come through are sin and laziness. <laughs> There are Indians living in an Indian world. Their cosmos is quite different from ours. Are there game animal houses above this world? Yes, there are a lot of animals. 
What animals are there in the houses? There are pigs like those on this earth. They come down. Pigs, tapirs, agouti, howler monkeys, spider monkeys, black monkeys, they all come down when it rains. When it rains, when the rivers rise again after a dry period, the animals come down. A shaman knows how to see and release the game animals. He blows tobacco and opens the game animal houses. Then they come out and go under his legs. When he sees they've finished coming out and have gone, he closes the house again. This side, another bunch goes. They go out under his legs. He stands with his legs apart. He has a stick. He opens the house with it. He watches them go, then he shuts it again. He chases them away with the stick. They run on down, and they come to this earth where we hunt them. That's how game animals are released from their houses. There are various government organizations, missionaries and foreign charities, all considering the Indian problem. But what is the Indian problem? The Indians have managed to live in this forest without poisoning it, without exhausting it, and without overcrowding it. For me, the most serious problems which face us are not Indian problems. The problem is white. Loma Linda is the Summer Institute of Linguistics center of operations in Colombia. From here, they fly out to 33 of Colombia's 48 tribes. By 1972, they'll work with them all. To many Colombians, the wealth of this base is a mystery. To the Catholic priests, it represents little America on national soil. Our eighth annual Columbia Panama Brands Conference, and at this time we will call Mr. Clarence Church, our director, to give his report. The Lord God has said, I will not share my glory with another. Let us be careful not to be presumptuous as we think of our program, and in the process rob God of that which is his and his alone. He has brought us here, he pays the bills, he turns the heart of the king, changes threats to blessings, problems to victories, and pain to praise. He is our God. We are the sheep of his pasture. His commission to us is to go. We have obeyed, and no good thing will he withhold from us. But we should not presume that we have all the time in the world. We should remind ourselves time and again that we are here because God brought us here, and he will keep us here until our job is finished. Because I am sure that God has his timetable as well. Before the arrival of white man's technology in northwest Amazonia, the Indian tribes lived isolated and hidden in the forest. They traded with each other, as the Maku still trade with river Indians like the Barasana. In this isolation, they retained their own customs and beliefs. This stream at the top represents the sky, the top layer of the universe. Under the waterfall, you have a cave, which is the house of the Sky Mother and the Sky Mother is the mother of all humanity. The Barasana find this place very exciting, magical. Inside there are large blocks of stone which are the first people sitting inside the cave at the dance that their mother held for them when they had been created.
This is their great origin site, where they first blew the sacred trumpets, where they first wore feathers, and where they became human beings. Anthropologist Stephen Hugh Jones has spent the last two years with the Barasana, recording their religion and mythology. Under the waterfall, hundreds and hundreds of swallows make their nests, and every evening they fly out through the water, and they fly all over the jungle. These swallows, they say, are the first people distributing themselves all over the land. The cave itself is both the Sky Mother and also her womb. And when she gave birth to humanity, the blood from her birth poured out over the rocks and pours down the waterfall, which is why this water is so red. Every single mountain, river, technical process, plant, animal, is the religion. When we say we're studying Barasana religion, it's rubbish. There isn't a religion. It's only who, us sort of Western people who have religion, going to church on Sundays, um, putting on your best clothes, a whole, you know, religious music. You have a category of religion. And then on the other side, you have cars in your daily life. This, it just doesn't exist here. There is no religion. Everything is religion. The Sky Mother made the world, but when it was first made, there was no earth and no trees, just hard stone. And the first people wandered around on this stone, frantically searching for water to drink. She told them that the water would be found in a tree, and they felled lots and lots of trees. And these stumps of the trees are the mountains around. And finally they came to the water tree, which was the tree of life. And they chopped and chopped at it with stone axes for two months. And finally when it fell, it crashed onto the ground and its branches made all the rivers. Unlike the Maku, who are very definitely forest people, the Barasana are river people. They don't really like to be in the forest. What they like is to live in huge houses in big clearings. <laughs> <laughs> the longhouse or Maloka is like a huge village meeting hall. It's a tremendously spacious place. They work there, they dance there, they sit and talk in the evenings. <laughs> From about 6 to about 10, 11 o'clock at night, they sit around in the centre of the house talking to each other. While they do this, they eat coca and they smoke cigars. They tell hunting stories, myths. Apart from Bosco and Persico, there are hardly enough people to carry on their traditional life in the way that they feel it should be done, who really know the mythology, the chants, the shamanism. And if you look at who those people are, they are, with only the exceptions of Bosco and Persico, they are almost the oldest people of the whole lot. And they observe that most people aren't interested in learning anymore the traditional stories and things.
they burnt ritual gear, they threw it in the rivers, they smashed the chicha boats, they showed these sacred trumpets to the women, which completely devalued them. They also actually burnt the Malokas. The people who really did this were the Montfortian missions, the Dutch missionaries that first effectively missionized this area. Then, in 1949, another Catholic order took over. And today, the Indian children in this mission boarding school are managed by Colombian priests and nuns. They regret the excesses of their predecessors, but Catholic policy in the mission territories is slow to change. They are setting themselves as judges of other societies. They choose to change them. They have not been asked to do this by society as, as a whole. It's a dogmatic assumption that because people have never heard the word of God, it is their moral duty to change. Taken away from the Maloka age seven, a child may well stay in the mission school for at least 11 years. They learn to accept authority and give orders. For the girls, this is a new freedom and contradicts the Indian custom of female subservience. When I visit places like Akariquara, one thing that impresses me is just how permanent a Catholic mission is. The massive buildings and the regimentation of the people, the whole scale of the operation suggests that the missions are very much here to stay. It's very tempting to try and put the missionaries into the category of bad people who are doing the Indians no good. But the missionaries are all very sincere people. And indeed, there are many things which they do do which are of great benefit, like providing medical services and, to a certain extent, protecting them from the exploitation of rubber gatherers and other white people around. They also provide education for the Indians, though the sort of education they provide is of rather questionable value. Preocupación. 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 Pre o de pre pre de estudio. The Barasana now want change, and if you remove the missionaries, you remove part of their life. Both sides show a complete ignorance as to the basic motivations of the other. The missionaries' ideas about Indians plagued with fears of devils and demons are only matched by the 
ideas of the Indians about Catholic priests who can't reproduce themselves because they can't have wives. The trouble is that the missionaries, coming from a stronger culture and far more convinced that they are right, will ultimately win. In the past, Catholic missions were established very much regardless of the wishes of the Indians, and in a very authoritarian way, to the extent of which they were, went as far as burning malokas, destroying people's ritual gear, and generally disregarding any feelings about Indians. But when they started coming to Pita Parana, where they were frightened, it would not have been a good policy. I mean, they would have got kicked out of here immediately. That combined with, I think, the physical conditions here, I mean, the isolation, has created a mission here with a priest here of a very, very different sort, and a man who's just beginning to become rather close to the Indians, in some senses closer than the American missionaries, and to begin to understand them, at least to begin to have some sympathy for their culture. This sympathy is returned by the Indians. I think the Indians do have a great sympathy for him as a human being, as a person. Padre Alorsa came to the area 22 years ago. In 1960, he realized <laughs> his dream and became the first missionary to enter the river Piraparana. Now, with four Protestant outposts on the same river system, he stands alone, a solitary representative of the Catholic Church. The lives of the Barasana women revolve around the preparation of manioc roots, the daily bread. By working with them, Christine Hugh Jones was gradually accepted. One of the things that has impressed us very much is seeing people going through the whole process from growing plants to eating the bread that comes from them. I've been asked how we make beads, and I can't explain to them. I finally say to them that glass is made from some kind of sand. And a woman once said to me, well, let's go and make some. But I had to explain that I didn't know how to do this. And the Indians find this absolutely amazing. In our society, we take credit for scientific knowledge, which in fact we have nothing to do with ourselves. Coca leaves are the raw material of, of cocaine, but there's an enormous difference. Cocaine is an addictive drug, while coca has extremely mild effects, and I've never seen Indians 
when deprived of coca, suffering from anything as dramatic as withdrawal symptoms. The Indians attach tremendous importance to coca. The men will often spend half the day processing it. In their dealings with whites before, they've always considered their own myths and their own social structure as something which you don't talk to white people about. They won't even tell their names to white people. And now we're trying to get these very things out of them. <laughs> First they met rubber gatherers who killed them, raped their women and got them to work under false pretenses, told them they were animals. And then came Catholic missionaries who told them they had to learn all about God and destroyed their property. And now you get present-day missionaries who treat them more or less as other human beings. The 153 North Americans who live at Loma Linda are all members of the Wycliffe Bible Translators, the second largest missionary organization in the world. The Summer Institute of Linguistics is the scientific arm of Wycliffe and operates in 10 Latin American countries. They entered Colombia in 1962 on a contract with the Colombian government to study the languages of the Indian tribes. In this contract, no mention was made of either Bible translation or their role as missionaries. Roger, Roger, we're standing by. In nine years, they fully organized themselves with advanced technical equipment and a radio link direct to the United States. Glad you got down there, all right. Over. Go ahead. We sure are glad we got here safe. It's really pretty down here at Loma Linda. We'll be here for about two weeks. Then we'll be leaving, go back to Bogota. Each December, the SIL holds its annual conference. Everybody attends, and the group reviews its future policy in the light of the past year's work. The accounts here have seldom looked better some of the improvements to note that took place during the past year are the installation of a soda pop machine so that we can use the refrigerator for other goodies like cheese and bacon, a better bread supply, the freezer van working on a limited basis, and continued interest and success in purchasing dried food and Tupperware. 
For the future, it is planned to begin a new select-your-own-vegetable system, improve on the meat situation, and to stock ice cream more frequently. <laughs> Keep up the good work. The linguists firmly believe that all requests, whether spiritual or material, can be answered through divine intervention if direct appeal is made to God. Last year, I asked prayer that the Lord would supply in 1970 the nine teams yet needed to occupy all of Colombia's tribes by 1972. In each case, unusually difficult circumstances faced the teams in giving God's message to the people to whom they were sent. We know from experience in the field and in the Word of God that any time we set out on a mission for the Lord's kingdom, Satan will show his ugly face in one subtle way or another. We are commanded by the Lord to show love to these individuals and attack the spiritual enemy with spiritual means, confidence in our Lord who is able to overcome and boldness in prayer to surmount all obstacles. We have seen huge mountains pushed into the sea and new relations established with individuals and our lives refined more perfectly for his glory. We made this very clear that we have come to, to give the Indians the message of God's love. There has been nothing done in a corner. This has been perfectly known ever since the beginning. It is true that this is not uh, in the contract as such, but if you will read the contract carefully, you will notice that all of the emphasis, excuse me, 90% of the emphasis is on linguistics. This is where we have put 90% of our effort. Some South American governments refuse to admit Protestant missionaries. By adopting the name the Summer Institute of Linguistics, the Wycliffe Bible translators have a scientific and cultural front which makes them acceptable in Catholic-dominated countries. Your primary objective is to get the word to the tribes. Oh. Why wasn't this said in, in your contract? We certainly, in the contract, of course we could not say this in the contract because the government, uh, this would be uh, hard for the government to defend. After all, again, the government is, uh, is not a religious organization and SIL uh, coming in, SIL is not a religious organization either. So we confess our need of thee. We can't see a minute ahead of us. We ask thee, Lord, to be our guide, and we'll give thee the glory for what is accomplished. In Christ's name, amen. Father, we are a needy people. We have nothing to opened our hearts to so little of the great and mighty love that you would have us know. And we would ask that this conference, that the dynamic love of Christ would shake to the very depths of each one of us, and that there would be a unity come forth from this conference such as we have never seen before. <laughs> Are there any other uh, items that should be mentioned now? There are so many things that we need to praise the Lord for. We should make it a definite matter of prayer for guidance as to how to make contact with these two very primitive tribes, one in the Valpes and one in Amazonas. Our fear is that they will be exterminated by uh, rubber hunters or other people who do not see them as being people but rather as those who are open for exploitation. May we never be distracted from the primary goal of giving your word to the tribes people of Colombia. May we never doubt the effect that your word has upon them. What a privilege it is to know God, to serve God, to love God, and to know that he loves us. We thank you for the assurance that the work that we are doing here in Colombia is not in our own strength, but it is a supernatural work empowered by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you that we stand on victory ground. The victory has already been won for us. We go forth to claim it, Lord. We go forth to claim it for the Indian peoples of Colombia, and not only for them, but for all those many and varied groups of people with whom we come in contact day after day. A Summer Institute of Linguistics worker once said that the most important thing that he'd done was to convince a people that thought that humanity was fundamentally good that in fact it was fundamentally bad.
They consume huge quantities of coca. When I eat it, all it does is to anesthetize my mouth a bit and cuts out sleep and hunger. But they say that the, the first human beings ate only coca and, and lived entirely off coca and tobacco and never ate food. And when they're in a dance or ceremony, they are in a sacred state. And while they are in this state, they mustn't eat food and will only eat coca and smoke tobacco. The Barasana think that Europeans and Colombians treat their children extremely badly because they give them cow's milk. And they think, how could people possibly deny their children human milk and give them cow's milk, which to them is milk of the danta, the largest animal in the forest, and one of the most poisonous substances you could possibly give a baby. In the evening, as they hand the coca round, there's a kind of formal ritual, a form of social expression of their togetherness and their desire to talk. They are fully aware of the fact that the whole thing is dying out. And if you say to them, do you want your children educated? Their reply is that they want the best of both worlds. They want to keep their dances, to keep their religion, to keep their myths. But they also want to know how to live in a white society and be like white people. And the sad thing is that they don't really seem to know what's hit them. <laughs> when men go out to invite people in other longhouses to come to a dance, they don't say, come and dance. They always say, come and drink chicha. In Barasana society, the women are the people who produce the bread which is eaten every day. The men are the people who know about religious matters, who run rituals, who organize political relationships with other groups. I think what everybody's failed to see is that these Indians do have a civilization, and I mean civilization as opposed to primitive state or whatever. And it is in many ways as involved and as intricate a civilization as our own. And nobody's prepared to look at it as simply a different way of life from which we can learn a lot of things ourselves. Straight.
constant prayer is that we as a branch never forget that God is blessing the work here in Colombia and Panama because the future of these countries are very close to his heart. People have prayed for Colombia, uh, for Colombia especially, for years. God is answering in these days. We are privileged to be here and to see him do it. We rejoice in this, for this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. <laughs> Some years ago, almost all the Malokas around here had feathers and had ritual equipment. And there were many ritual specialists, and so almost everybody had dances. But today, this is one of the few Malokas left where this sort of dance is still held. Feathers which they wear are the feathers that the first people wore when they were created. And by wearing these feathers, they too become the first people. <laughs> The sacred other world of the Barasana is normally only accessible through dreams in which the soul wanders. The other way of achieving contact is through the use of the hallucinogenic drug Yahe. This drug induces dreamlike visions and also brightly colored abstract patterns. And these are thought to be the soul of the taker of the drug leaving his body and entering the other world, the world of the first ancestors. The drug has to be prepared by a ritual specialist and handed round by the same man. It cannot be taken in any other context except during dances. <laughs> <laughs> Yahe is very bitter, and when you drink it, it makes you vomit immediately. And the more you drink it, the more you associate it with vomiting. But the Barasana don't see vomiting as being sick. <laughs> but as a form of purification. And when they've purified their bodies, the yahe starts to take effect. The myths of origin recount in detail how the first people came from their origin sites and populated the land, and they're told in the form of a journey. Mm -hmm. 
As the chanter chants, he describes the mountains and the trees, the sacred places. And as they chant, they become the first beings. The feathers themselves, because they're able to transform ordinary human beings into sacred beings, are said to contain magical power. And when the dance is over, it is the duty of the ritual specialist or shaman to wipe off the dangerous forces from the heads of the dancers and to blow them away out of the maloka. Nikano ka sa mi sabena añuro jumbuena Jesure wakuna eh kanoaka basana kana San Miguel mani biogmena añuro o akre nikano jumbuena sa kanoaka basaya nikakare a ti Jesus Muere vere vige mai sere. Mi cacara ti Jesús. A ti rota hostia cuerpo en mí. Ni capan puerta ni rosa. A ti rota ni cristianos. Jesús fuere llenaba. El cuerpo y la sangre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo guarden nuestras almas para la vida eterna. <tose> 